Okay. Uh, any questions? Let's take a few reactions. I'd appreciate that. What you've seen tonight, as I said at the beginning, is the world premiere display of these paintings. Nobody's ever seen these before. What do you think? Thank you. Should they go in a book? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Should they be used? Yeah. How do you react to the artistic style? I mean, it is kind of mixing the abstract and the, the real. It's unusual. I mean, this is not a Picasso style, and yet it's got a lot of that Spanish geometric uh, influence in it. But it's real. To me, it masterfully combines the worldly and the spiritual that we've been talking about. These stories can be read at different levels. Yes, they are real events. Yes, this is real life. But we're also talking about something that is planned, it's organized, it's mathematical in a way. So you get both, the, uh, both of those dimensions. And to me, I think his artistic style, tell me, did you react this way? Opens it up to you so the narrative of the paintings isn't so constraining that you're focused on kind of the, the venue, the, the, the geography, did he get this window right, or does this look like a Palestinian house, or, you know, it, it kind of puts it into a different register of abstraction, generality, and universality that I think the parables, they work everywhere in culture. So did, did that work for you, does the, uh, the style? It takes a little adjusting, but I think it, uh, it's consistent with with uh, the real meaning. Any other any comments on the art? Yeah. Question, yes. Shout out real loud. Okay. I love the art. I think um, what's interesting to me is I've been following a lot of Mormon artists lately, and this is a general direction that the art is moving. Um, and I personally can, like, when I create my own art, I'm not at his level, but I love the using abstract because it allows you to represent more symbolically. So I think it's perfect for parables. Um, I know some people prefer the more realistic paintings, but I, it's interesting to me that so many artists are moving this direction in Mormon art, and it's, it's really stunning. So a lot of like the art shows you see at the Church Museum of Art, you're seeing more of this, um, and it's a way that people are expressing that. Uh, excellent. Yeah, we, we are getting away from kind of the illustrator, naturalist uh, expressions, which of course are touching. BYU uh, Art Museum, has recently had a very large exhibit on, uh, 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 on <coughs> symbolic representation of scriptural passages. And it, it was a daring exhibit, but it's, uh, it's been a very well-received exhibit. And one of these days we may have a Jorge Coco Sant'Angelo exhibit where we can get all of his art together. He's been very prolific in the last few years. He's very, very excited about this, and the response has been good. Another question? Someone or a comment? Yes, Brother Anderson. Um, for me, the artwork requiring a little bit more interpretation um, was more of a question to me rather than a presentation. Mm -hmm. It was full, more soul searching. It was, um, what do I think of this rather than this is the artist telling me what he thinks of it. So, um, it evoked different <coughs> emotions, different thoughts than. Good. Good. And I like that comment because I think it puts us all in the position. Remember, I started with Matthew 13. Jesus tells these stories and he puts them out there. One commentator long ago said the parables of Jesus are like a person coming into your house and putting a mirror in your room. And when you look into the mirror, what you see is yourself. In a, in a sense, the parables invite you to see a lot of things that you're going to see. It's not telling you what you're supposed to see. But I think when Jesus says, I tell these because 
well, they don't have eyes to see and ears to hear what I'm really getting at, but they do have eyes to see certain things. And it, I think Jesus is telling these in a way that is multivalent to have lots of uh, applications, as you've, you've sensed, I think, quite correctly. Yes? I was kind of heading toward that direction of the reason our Father in Heaven and Savior teach in symbols is to enable us to get various levels of understanding. And so if you have an increased abstraction in the work, you have the ability to get away from some of the details and go more for the principles and concepts, and, and you can dig sometimes a little deeper into the ideas. Excellent. Do you find that anywhere else in our Mormon culture in particular? The temple, exactly. Uh, people who go to the temple expecting to have things spelled out, you know, word by word, and just to, you know, it's obviously a, a very symbolically rich uh, experience at every step of the way. But if you don't understand the plan of salvation from the beginning to the end, everything that's going on in the temple kind of seems disjointed. So the symbolic, uh, I think the parables of Jesus relate to the temple because the mystery, when I talked about the mysteries having to do with initiation and, and ritual with ordinances that bring you into a covenant relationship with God, membership in a society, um, I think that's what's happening with the teaching of Jesus. When he leaves, he leaves his disciples knowing what's going on. And uh, they're not trying to figure it out. They, especially in the 40-day literature, we have the resurrected Lord teaching much as he does in 3rd Nephi in a more concise and uh, organized way, these symbolic meanings and uh, the eternal plan. Maybe a couple more hands I see. Yeah. Probably what I was saying is exactly what you've been saying, but at first when I saw the art, I thought, oh, that's so simple, there's really not much to it. And I thought, oh, that's just like a parable. Oh, that's a nice story. But then as you point out a couple of things, it's like the mind starts pondering, just like they pondering the parables. Yes. So then you start pondering and then just like that, you start to see more of the art and it's revealed to you as you ponder it. So it's really, I think his style is symbolic and terrible because it seems so simple just in glance at it. And that's expressed very well. I hadn't thought of it quite that way, but I can say that in my own house, I have a couple of these where my grandchildren see them. And, you know, at first it was just kind of simple, and then I said, well, what do you see in that picture? And we see different things, and the children will actually come up with some things I hadn't seen. So it does open up, like the parables, lots of avenues of very productive resonance that we have with, uh, uh, with these principles of the gospel. Yes? I thought the artwork was very interesting depicting the duality of everything. Yes. The duality of the, the, the different contrasts of color and light and darkness and expressions and uh, especially with the servant that was forgiven and then this forgiven. Yeah, the X in the middle. And now it's like the mercy and justice and the duality of the mercy and justice and the duality of our own persona of the natural man and, uh, and you know, this being the son of that's an excellent point. Thank you for mentioning that. I had not personally thought of the parables until I began working on these. I commissioned all of these, and as we worked through this, it became much more obvious to me, as I've suggested, that every parable is a reflection of the truth that we have in 2 Nephi Chapter 2, verse 11, that there needs must be an opposition in all things. And that one opposition will always boil down to choosing life through Christ or death through Satan. Ultimately, that's the choice, but it's manifested at every turn. And so as the art, like you say, the, uh, the drawing and the lines and the shafts of light and the dark 
Yeah, it's, uh, it helps to, to really uh, make all of those contrasts much more pervasive in uh, each one of these, these stories and in all of our lives. We have to be on our guard. You must watch and pray always, Jesus said, lest ye fall into temptation. Now, why? Because that opposition is going to be with us and with us always. Well, I'd love to hear from any of the rest of you. Thank you for your comments. And uh, uh, one last one or two. I hear. A couple more. Well, I didn't count how many parables you went through here. Maybe you could refresh our mind, but ultimately... Well, they're on the handout. We have 24 in this series. Okay, and how many, um, how many more are there? And how many parables are there? Refresh our minds. Well, it depends on how you count them. If you uh, count as a parable the salt that has lost its savor, that will be cast out and trodden underfoot by men, is that a parable or is that a metaphor? It's hard to know. Uh, what to include in this. I've included some of those smaller ones, uh, but usually we think of a parable as a story or some kind of a setting where a person is doing something like a uh, shepherd who's going out or a person who's building a house or something like that. There aren't many more than the ones we've touched. Yes? I thought this was going to be a really boring intellectual talk, but I came to it anyway because <laughs> I, I need help in being more spiritual. But the paintings helped me access what you were saying. And it helped me to see that I want to go back and look at the parables again and see that there's so much more there that I haven't been seeing. Yeah. And so I really love that you did this together because I loved the things that you were saying, but I might not have been able to hear them without the paintings. And I and wouldn't have been able to say them without the painting. <laughs> and the painting, no, like someone said, because they weren't strict realism, it left it much more open-ended to help start to see, hey, there's a lot more Wonderful. than what I've been seeing and what I thought I knew. There's a lot more to be found there, and I need to go back and back and back. So Thank really you for that. You know, a teacher can <laughs> hardly ever be thanked more than to have exceeded someone's expectation. <laughs> great, great <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me say also that we are commanded to love God with what? With all of our heart, with all of our soul, all of our might and with all of our mind. It's all of it, everything we have. So we, we can bring that together. It, I think it does. It gives me a feeling of fulfillment and fullness and, and completeness and consecration of all that we've been blessed with. So I hope that that's come through. It, it sounds like it has. I hope you do it again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sister? Okay. Yeah. The red robe, because he says, I have trodden the wine press alone, and grapes are red. And so when you get into, and I can show you archaeological pictures, uh, pictures of archaeological remains of wine presses. They're, they're like small swimming pools. And they're built on a hillside. And the people just gather all the grapes and they throw them into this swimming pool. It's plastered. And then people literally get in and stomp on the grapes. And the grapes squirt all over the place. And when you come out, you're all red. And the grapes, you know, they have little channels where the grape... It, this would not pass FDA standards <laughs> for <laughs> food purity, but... But then they'd gather the wine and they'd put it into the jars and, you know. But uh, he says, I have, I have trodden the wine press alone. 
That's a big job. It's a lot of grapes to step on. But as a result, he, he has the symbolic redness of his blood. And that's why in the, of course, that was the main thing that they would drink in their, uh, you know, Passover feasts and regular meals. And so the wine, when you drink the wine, remember me was the, uh, the symbol of the sacrament because it represents his blood. He uses that in the parable of the Good Samaritan when the Samaritan comes and first he washes the wounds away with what? With wine. Why? It has alcohol in it. So it's a disinfectant. And then he will anoint with oil, maybe as a healing blessing, but more than that, olive oil was the lotion that would soothe and would help the healing of the skin. And then he binds the wound. And the word for binding there is the same word that's used for the binding of Isaac in his sacrifice or the covenantal binding when you, what is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Same word is being used in these places. So the wine and the oil and the covenant, it, you can see that little subtext or uh, going on. But the wine carries a lot of symbols and when Jesus comes, what he brings with him is the, the results, the power of the atonement. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Um, thank you, Widso Foundation, for once again allowing us to uh, have such a great evening together. Travel safely and don't get stopped by any robbers <laughs> on your way down from the temple to Jericho or wherever you're going. Thanks.